God not only spared my life, but he was merciful to give me a life that I could continue to do what I love to do, and that is preach and teach God's word and, and see men and women uh, come to faith in Christ, see them grow in their faith, and see them train so that they are able to do uh, ministry with other people and for other ministry, uh, for other people. So thank you for your part in all of that. Um, I was very much aware of the fact that people were praying, uh, very much aware of the fact that people were bringing not just myself, but a heart attack is not just an isolated thing for an individual. Uh, our whole family went through this together. And so it wasn't just praying for me, it was praying for Amanda, praying for the kids, uh, praying for our family. So thank you uh, for all of that. Uh, before we open up the Word of God this morning, I do want to draw your attention to the back table there, just where the map and the missionary prayer cards and things are. You'll see a strange flag draped over the table. It's that one right there. Uh, that is the Irish flag. That is the country that God called us to more than four, almost 40 years ago now. We've been in Tralee, in Ireland, for almost 34 years now. Uh, some of the years prior to that, we were, of course, raising our support, getting ready to go. But there's a, a sign-up sheet at the back table. If you don't already receive our uh, prayer letter, uh, our email prayer updates, and would like to do so, you can put your name and your email address there on that sheet. We also have some new prayer cards. <coughs> Excuse me. And please help yourself to those. If they run out, we'll replenish the, the supply. So don't worry about taking the last one there. We have others with us. So help yourself to those. And use those as a reminder to pray for us. I'm sure that you already do. We trust that you already do. And um, we'd love for you to continue to do that. And there's also, if you like looking at pictures, there's also a, an iPad with a, uh, photos that are going on a loop there. So you'll see a little bit visually uh, what it is we do and where it is that we do it. And so again, help yourself to what you see back there. If you don't see something that you, you're interested in, come and talk to us. We'll be available to talk after the service. We'll be here again this evening, as Pastor Jeff said. Uh, we'll be happy to talk with you personally about anything you might have questions regarding. Let's get to the word. Um, if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 13. <coughs> Excuse me. This morning, I, I'm not going to share what, at least what I consider to be a, a typical or a normal missionary challenge. Because I don't, I don't see missions as substantially different from ministry in general. Uh, Missions is simply doing what we have started to do in one place in another place. Uh, we became involved in ministry when we were young uh, people, Amanda and I. We went to Bible college together. For, for me, that was the first time to be exposed to the Word of God. And it was there that, I've, that I learned about God. It is there that I learned about what God was doing in His world. And it's there that God began to lead my heart into the ministry that we are presently a part of. Uh, so missionary work is simply uh, the work of God in another place. Um, and every one of us can do that. Every one of us is called to do missionary work. It's not something that just has to do with the foreign field. It's not something that has to do with you know, picking up and leaving and going someplace necessarily. It's simply telling other people about Jesus Christ and seeing them come to know him as their savior and then training them. That's what we've been doing. That's what I'm sure your leadership here is doing with you. And I'm sure that many of you are trained to do that yourselves and are presently doing that likewise. Uh, Romans chapter 13. We want to read just a few short verses, verses 11 to 14. And, and then we'll, we'll take a moment to uh, pray and ask the Lord to use the time that we have together for his profit and, and our good. Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 11, Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, 
but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Uh, this is a good day, not because it's warm and sunny outside, uh, not even because we are gathered together in this building, but it's good because you are part of it. You have created this day, and it is a day that you have blessed us with being a part of. And so, well, Lord, we come here today with, with full hearts, ready to give thanks to you for all of your many graces, many blessings to us, but we also recognize that we are needy, that we are not all that we should be, and we don't know all that we should know. And so we ask, Lord, that during this brief time together that you would help us to come to know you in a, in a deeper, fuller way. And that we would, we would recognize our responsibilities to you and that we would be thankful for the blessings from you. Lord, help us to understand this, your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I was in the hospital after the heart attack for a, a little short of two weeks. Uh, about a week in one hospital and then transferred down to the hospital in Tralee uh, for the remaining time. And hospitals are not a, a great place to be, but one of the things that hospitals provide you with is time. Uh, time with nothing else to do. You're, you're in a bed. Um, there's no, at least in Tralee, there was no television. Uh, you know, there's no radio playing. Uh, I was in Limerick, in the hospital in Limerick, I was in a room by myself. Uh, so there's plenty of time to think, and that's what I want to speak to you today about time. Uh, you'll notice in your, your bulletin insert the title of this message, and I don't often title my messages, but for your sake I did. Um, and the title of this message is, Do You Have Any Idea What Time It Is? Do you have any idea what time it is? I want to try and paint a picture for you. You are a parent. Just pretend if you're not a parent yet, just pretend with me for a moment. You're a parent. It's well after midnight. And you're sitting downstairs with your chair turned to the front door. And you're anxiously looking at your watch. And you can almost hear the seconds tick by. And then suddenly the door opens, and in walks your son or your daughter. It's well past curfew. It's well past the time that they were supposed to be home. And without saying much of anything else, you look down at your watch, and you point to it, and you say to them, do you have any idea what time it is? Maybe to give you another scenario to think about, uh, you're on the phone. You're, you're ringing a friend of yours. You're phoning a friend of yours. And, and the phone rings away in your ear. And you're, you're kind of curious as to why it's ringing so much. And so after a, what seems like a very long time, someone at the other end answers the phone. And um, a couple seconds later, they kind of say in a very sleepy voice, hello? And you don't think anything of it. And so you try to make a joke about, said, did, did, did I just wake you up from a nap? And then the person on the other end begins to explain that it's 2 o'clock in the morning, their time. It's only 9 o'clock, my time. And then you realize what you've done. That's not just a hypothetical situation. That actually happened, and I'm the one who made the call. I'm not, I wasn't used to at the time. It was our first trip back to the States after having been in Ireland for four years, and I'd gotten used to calculating time the other way. We're five hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time in Ireland, and so I was used to thinking, it's early there. So I pick up the phone, and, and then I, I make that, that huge mistake. And as soon as I realize what I've done, I start to apologize as best I can. The person on the other end can't see the shades of red that my face has turned. And I apologize again and again for my, my insensitivity and my stupidity. 
But I want you to try and apply those two stories to this passage. If the child who comes, comes home past the curfew would have known the time, would have been aware of the time and alert to what time it was, they would have hopefully been home within the curfew. If I had been a little bit more aware and was thinking a little bit more clearly, I wouldn't have made that phone call in the first place. See, knowing the time makes a big difference in the decisions that we make and the, thi the things that we do in light of that. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get the, the Roman believers that he's writing to here. I think that's what he is trying to help them to understand, that knowing the time determines the decisions that we make and the actions that we take. We're going to look just at three things that seem to jump off the page to me, and I hope they will to you. The notes that you have in your, your insert, you can take notes, and I'll try my best to make sure you get the right word for the right blank on your page. Um, but hopefully that will be helpful to you to make sense of this passage. So we're going to look at the exhortation concerning the time, the characteristics of the time, and the application that comes from the time. So with that in mind, let's just dive right in to this passage and ask the Lord to help us understanding what he says. In verses, verse 11, the first part of verse 11, Paul begins by saying, and this do. He makes a statement. That's the first blank on your page under that heading. <coughs> he makes a statement. And the statement is, and this do. I'm sure Pastor Jeff and some of the other leaders in the church or teachers in the church have, have taught you how to study your Bible. And whenever you get to a, pro, a pronoun like this, uh, you, you need to begin to try and identify what the this is in reference to. Well, in the context of Paul's message here in chapter 13, it goes back to verse 8 of this chapter where Paul commands the Roman believers, owe no man anything except to love one another, for he who loves has fulfilled the law. Paul commands the Roman believers to love one another, the, the same kind of love that Jesus commanded those disciples. Now we are to love one another as he has loved us. It's the same word and the same responsibility. Love one another as he has loved us. So he makes that statement, and then it follows with a reason. He follows that up with a reason. The reason being because you know the time. He, he phrases it there, knowing the time, in verse 11. The, the idea, the thrust of that phrase, knowing the time, is because you already know the time. They were already alert to, they were already aware of the time. The time being the, the quality or the character of the time. In other places, Paul describes this same period of time, which, let's face it, is the same period of time that you and I are living in now. He describes that same time in chapter 4 of the first epistle of Timothy. He says that in the latter times. He describes it as latter or later times. Again, in the second epistle to Timothy, in chapter 3, verse 1, he calls them perilous times. He's going in the next section of this passage, he's going to describe the characteristics of this time. But right now, he makes the statement and the exhortation to love one another because you know the time. You have known it, you still know it, you are aware to it. Now live this way. In verses 11b through 12a, he tells us the characteristics. He describes the time. What's this time like? What can we observe of the days in which we live? What things step out of time and, and, and more or less hit us in the face about the times we're living? There are four things, I think, that we can see reflected in these next verse, <coughs> in this next verse. The first of those characteristics, there are four of them, is that the time in which Paul was writing, and still true today, the time in which we live is an urgent time. It's a time characterized by urgency. Notice he says in the second part of verse 11, knowing the time, now, that now it is high time. 
the, the, the idea there is it's, it's right now. The time is right now. It's a, the, the stress is it's a, the right kind of time. There's an urgency behind what Paul says. It's the, it's the right now kind of time. And along with that urgency, there is a sense of anticipation, particularly for the believer. It may not come across that way to those who haven't put their trust in Jesus Christ, but at least for the believer, the time in which Paul is describing is a time of both urgency and anticipation. We anticipate, as Paul says here, the, for now, he says at the end of verse 11, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Isn't that a great thing? That this morning when we woke up, we were one day closer to heaven. One day closer to either dying and being, being raised to heaven or having Jesus Christ return in this moment and take us there. Every day that goes by is one, one more day closer to being in heaven with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of anxious to get there. I know that I've got to work while I'm here, make the best of what I am given while I'm, uh, while I'm here, and I'm thankful that I've been given an opportunity to continue to do that. But it wouldn't have been a sad thing for me, at least, if the heart attack took me home. Um, I'm glad that I didn't, because I don't think I'm finished yet. I don't think I've done what I'm supposed to do yet. And so I'm here still. But there's that anticipation. It's an urgent time. There's not a lot of it. Time is the only resource that I'm aware of that cannot be renewed. Once the moment is gone, it's gone, and we don't get it back again. So it's a time of urgency coupled together with a time of anticipation. Secondly, Paul describes this time as kind of a a, a generally inactive time. He goes on to start verse, nine, uh, verse 12. The night is far spent. Uh, uh, the day is at hand. And we are to awaken out of our sleep. He, he seems to describe a, a, a society in which people are walking around with their eyes closed. People who are, who are dull. People who are insensitive, people who are numbed to what's going on, what's, what's really taking place in front of them. And so he says, it's time to wake up. It's time to get busy. The, the word sleep here is the, the, comes from the Greek word that we get our English word hypnosis from. People are walking around hypnotized by life. And it's time to wake up, Paul says. It's time to get active because the time in which we're living is largely described or characterized by an inactivity. Thirdly, this time Paul describes here is a brief time. It's a time of brevity. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. And the idea is that the th things are almost over. Things are almost completed. Soon, everything will be completed the period we're living in is a short period of time and it's quickly coming to a close. And then lastly, it's a time of contrast. Notice that Paul described, you know, it's time in verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. And just a couple of verses later, he's going to talk about the idea of darkness and light. The time in which Paul was writing to the, the Roman believers and still true of our day today, maybe even more so, it is a time of contrast between those who are living in the day, those who are living in the light, and those who are living in the darkness. It's a, it's a time of contrasts, clear contrasts, and we should be able to see those very clearly as we look out on life today. So Paul has exhorted the believers here. He's exhorted them to love Love one another. Why? Because that is the fulfillment of all that stands behind the law. We don't live a life of love so that we complete the law. We live a life of love because Jesus already completed it for us. We live a loving life because that's what Jesus wants for us. 
And we do that with a sense of urgency because the time that we've been allotted is very short, very brief. It's a time of contrast. It's a time of urgency. It's a time of anticipation. And now Paul is going to move from exhorting us. He's going to move from describing things for us. He's going to move toward an application. Taking all of that information and, and making it real for the Roman believers and hopefully for us as well. He's going to apply it to us. Notice the first word at the second part of verse 12, therefore. We were taught in Bible college, and I'm sure you've been taught here in this church, that whenever you see the word therefore, you ask the question, what's it there for? <coughs> Why is Paul saying this? Well, it's a, it's a mechanism, it's a linguistic mechanism that helps us to, to pause just briefly, try and summarize all that we've just read, and then move on to what he's going to say in the next few words. It's a word of conclusion. It's a word of application. And, and there are three things that Paul says in application of the truths that he's already shared. The first of those is found in verse 12, the second part of verse 12. Therefore, and they're all let us statements. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. That, uh, that word, cast off, some translations uh, translate it as, so let us put aside it's a legitimate translation, but it kind of loses some of, its, some of its expression. It kind of loses some of its in, uh, intensity. The word really has, let's throw it away. Let's cast it off. Uh, it's much more dramatic. It's much more expressive the way the New King James translates it here. Let us cast it off. My mother grew up on a farm. I didn't. I have no idea what farming must be like, but my mom... One of nine children grew up on a small farm just outside the town where I went to school. And as farm families, all the kids have some responsibility for the running of the farm. My mom's responsibility was, at least in part, milking cows. She, was a, she won a blue ribbon at the school fair for milking. Uh, so she would go out in the morning, very early in the morning, as you do, uh, to milk the cows. And, she would do what she needed to do and then come back into the house. And on the back side of their house was what they referred to as a mudroom. I think I heard somebody else use that same terminology here. There was a mudroom. It was well, well named because you took off, you came in with all the mud and guck, muck on your shoes and clothes. And it was in that room that you took all of that off. But it's more than just taking off a piece of clothing. Have you ever been in a hurry to get dressed and you can't find what you're looking for and you're flinging clothes left, right, and center in an attempt to find something to wear? Well, that's more the picture that Paul paints here. It's not just gently slipping off a shirt or a pair of trousers or shoes that are soiled. It's, it's almost to the point of ripping them off and throwing them away. Paul says, let us cast off the works of darkness. Paul has a lot to say about these kinds of works. He describes them in Ephesians 5.11 as unfruitful. They don't really produce anything of any value. Uh, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verses 22 to 30, he, he gives a list of some of what those are. And he does the same thing in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. He, he calls them there the, the, works, or the, 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 the works of the flesh, or to keep the analogy, the fruits of the flesh. Um, he's going to name categories here in these next few verses. Uh, the fruits that we are to get rid of, the fruits that we are to cast away. In verse 13, he, he uses three pairs of works or deeds. And the first of those in verse 13 is revelry and drunkenness. <coughs> the idea is wild, wild partying which leads to riots. In fact, the Old King James translation uses the word riot in that cup, that pair. Put that stuff away. Wild partying and celebration that causes drunkenness. That's, those are things that should never be, never be found in the believer's life. In fact, never be named among believers at all. The second pair is lewdness and lust. That's sexual immorality, but it's much more intense. I remember somebody telling me or listening to someone speak on the radio 
And he was saying that in the Greek language of Paul's day, there were hundreds of words that would describe the culture of his day. And they were, they were words that talked about all kinds of immorality of every shape and description. And the one that Paul uses here, lewdness and lust, it has the idea, in fact, one commentator says the word that Paul uses here is one of the ugliest words in the Greek language. It describes a person who has not a care about what he does. He doesn't care what kind of shameful thing he's involved in. He doesn't care who might see it or who might be the object of it. He has not a notion of care about what he does. And this is part of what Paul says we're to put away. We're to, we're to cast it off. We're to get rid of it. We're to clear it out of our wardrobe because it has nothing of any value to the believer. And then the last pair that he mentions here in verse 13 is strife and envy. And that, the idea in these words is violence and fighting. This is, these, three, these six words are really a group of words that go together. And one of them leads to the next. And one of them produces the next. Violence and fighting. So he tells us, cast them off. Take them off and throw them away. Secondly, he says in verse 12, put on. He says, let us put on the armor of light. Again, there's that contrast between the works of darkness and the armor of light. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 36, he says, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. The believer is a child of light. Paul calls us that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, as he gives thanks to the Lord for what the Lord has done for him and for us, he says that we have been qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And then again in, verse, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5, he says, You are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. We have been transported. We have been translated, as Paul says in Colossians, from the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. What a wonderful way to be described. Now, let's face it. We are not always light, are we? We don't always shine the way that we have been designed to shine. We don't always live the way that God cares for us to live or commands that we live. But it doesn't change the fact that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, then you are light. That is part of what God has made you and I to be. And now... We are to live as the people that God has made us to be. So he says, put off, cast away, cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. We need that armor. He describes it in Ephesians chapter 6, those pieces of armor. They're metaphorical pieces. We don't suit up with armor to get ready for our day, but we certainly put on the things that God has given to us to protect ourselves from what's happening around us. And then lastly, <clears throat> in verses 13 and 14, Paul says, let us walk properly. The word walk in the New Testament is a, is a metaphorical way of describing the style that we, the, the lifestyle that we maintain, the, the habitual way of life that we live. And it's supposed to be a life consistent with properness. Decency is the same as this word that's translated, same word translated in other places, or honestly. We're to live honest and decent lives. How do we do that? Well, again, he uses the contrasting things here. He says not, we already looked at those words. But instead of living in this way, Paul says that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of a proper walk, part of, part of a proper lifestyle. We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The idea is to display outwardly what God has accomplished inwardly. To mimic or to imitate, to pattern our lives after Jesus Christ. Remember the mudroom. Mom never went into the, the house proper with barn clothes on. 
She always took them off first. And there was a clean set of clothes hanging in the mudroom that she could put on that hadn't been soiled, that didn't smell like the barn, and she would walk into the house with those on instead. We are exactly the same. Think of your old life as that, that soiled piece of clothing that really never worked very well for you, that got you into a lot of trouble, that caused you to rebel and caused you to sin and caused you to defy the, the living God. Throw it away. Don't pick it up again. Get rid of it. And instead, walk properly. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, f for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And the thrust of that phrase is stop making plans to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We are I'm not a planner. I really am not. And ask my wife. Well, don't because it's embarrassing. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at planning. But you know the one thing I am good at planning? Is sinning. I know how to do it. So do you, sadly. Paul is saying to the Roman Christians, stop it. Not, not avoid it, but it was already taking place. And Paul says, stop planning to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Do what you need to do in order to avoid the, the direction that your, your lusts, your flesh, your desires are pulling you toward. John MacArthur in his study Bible, on a note on this verse, he says, most sinful behavior results from wrong ideas and lustful desires that we allow to linger in our minds. You know, don't, don't even entertain the thought of doing such and such. Cast off the works of darkness, put on, or, or let us walk properly and, and put on the armor of light. Those three exhortations. Knowing the time, being alert to the time, being alert to the characteristics of the time, being alert to our, our tendency to follow the dictates of the time should, ref, should, should cause us to make responses, different responses, to make different choices to go in different directions. In the wider context of what Paul is saying here, we are to love one another. We are to, to live a life of love. And that should lead us to make loving decisions. And in the context, Paul begins the context of this verse by saying, it should change the way we look at authority. Because that's how he begins the chapter. Verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except of God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, I don't like certain traits of our government. I'm talking about Irish government as much as I am talking about anybody else's government. I don't always like what the government says I must do. I don't like the idea of someone else telling me that I have to do something. And it doesn't have to be a governing official. It could be a boss at work. It could be a coach on a sports team. It could be a teacher in a classroom. I don't like being told what to do. I like the independence. I, I, I crave the, the, the control of my own life. But Paul says a loving way of responding to the time is by submitting ourselves to those who God has placed over us in various situations and various positions. Because as Paul goes on to describe, they are God's avengers. They are there to punish unrighteousness. They don't always get it right, but in general, that is a good thing. I need that. I need those boundaries that are set for me because I wouldn't set them for myself. He also says that this idea of loving each other or loving one another should result in a, a life of service to my neighbor. 
He, he quotes some of the Ten Commandments in these next few verses. And, and, he, and in verse 9 he says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not, commit, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And then if there's any, any, anything else left, he says, it's all summed up in the words, love your neighbor as yourself. A loving way of living is a, love, is a way that doesn't do harm, but benefit to other people. That's part of what responding to the time should lead to. And then finally, it should lead to lovingly imitating our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> I like Christmas. So what does Christmas have to do with Romans 13? I love Christmas. I love almost everything about Christmas. Um, I love the decorations. I love the gifts. I love the foods. I love the songs. Well, most of the songs. Um, there's one song, and you'll recognize it. I won't give you the title. Just listen to the words, and you'll know it right away. It starts, you better not shout, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why, fill in the rest. Santa Claus is coming to town. So we use that little, that little tune uh, to hopefully control our children's behavior. They know Christmas is coming. It may be only a week or two away or a day or two away. They know it's coming. And the threat in the song is, if they misbehave, Santa will find out. And there might be one gift short in the stocking. Now, I'm, I'm not here to judge those who believe in Santa or who, sell, who make Santa a part of your Christmas celebration. That's not the point. The point is that if we can use a little song to influence and affect the behavior of our children or grandchildren for that matter. Knowing what time it is in our lives, knowing what the time is like in which we live, should result in making choices, taking decisions that will reflect that knowledge. Christ is coming back. And unlike Santa, he knows everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows it all. He knows the things you don't want anyone else to know. He sees the things that you don't want anyone else to see. And he knows them perfectly. There's no shading the truth with him. There's no hiding with him. He's coming back. We know that. God has promised that. It's both a, a promise to his people and a warning to those who have yet to put their trust in Jesus Christ. How will this knowledge affect the things that we do today? And I'll just ask the question I asked at the beginning. Do you have any idea what time it is? Do you have any idea what time it is? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that you've given to us here today. Thank you for, for lovingly leading us here this morning. It's no accident that we are in this building. And yes, we made the choice to come. We got up in time. We cleaned ourselves up and dressed ourselves and had our breakfast and we came. You got us here safely, for which we're thankful. But you led us here. In your sovereignty and in your providence, we are here because of you. And you brought us here because you wanted us to think about these words. They may be words that we've never read before. They may be things that we've heard dozens or more times before. But they are still pertinent. They are still active. They are still powerful. They are still necessary. Lord, we know because you've told us 
what this day is like, what this time is like. You've, you've expressed it through the words of the Apostle Paul and others who wrote this book. You inspired them to, to give us those truths because they are necessary. We know what our day is like. We know what our time is like. We are alert to and aware of the time. And now we ask, Lord, for the wisdom in order to apply that knowledge in a way that reflects who you have made us. We do that out of love. We do that because we desire to, to do the things that please you, but we also do it because we know that there is a world around us that is watching, taking note of the things that we do, taking note of the things that we say, taking note of the things that we support and the things that we, we object to. They look and see how we treat one another. And they are influenced one way or another in regard to you because of what they see. Father, help us to live a life that, that is so clearly godly, so clearly in tune with the scriptures that people will accurately see who you are. And then we'll turn in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for our time together in the Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.